We all must undertake our own journey. We must come to terms with the world we live in, with the circumstances we are born into, and with the challenges we face, both on an individual as well as a societal level. For most of my life, I've struggled to undertake my own journey. Why is that? Lately, I've been trying to come to terms with my life and my current circumstances. My whole life, I've tried to force myself to become something that did not always align with my own internal value system. I chased dreams I didn't care about, set goals I didn't plan on achieving, and made plans I knew were not right for me. Yet, I persisted. I tried to mold myself into someone I did not even know how to be. So here I am, age 26 years old, lost and unsure of what the future holds. I've tried to find answers in books. Many books speak about how you should make yourself through your choices. I focused on how I could change who I am through my daily habits. Increase your level of responsibility. Change the stupid things you know you are doing that are preventing you from being your best self. Take on the maximal load of responsibility you can manage. And through this journey of pain and suffering, you will find yourself. This type of attitude must have been helpful for many. And I'm sure taking such steps can do more good than harm, for some at least. But these are not the steps that have helped me to heal, grow and change in my own life. The call to responsibility, where you shape yourself through your choices, is to put the cart in front of the horse, at least for some of us. It presumes a certain level of self-insight and freedom of choice, which does not accurately reflect the internal and external lives of many individuals. This idea that many of your struggles, faults, bad habits and circumstances are in your control and your fault and as such completely up to you to change is perhaps not the first step many of us should take to move closer to our true selves. I have this feeling that what I need to uncover, what I need to find, is not found through my choices where I take on an immense amount of responsibility or aim for the highest good that I can conceptualize, but is rather found inside myself where I have to settle, let go and listen to what I've lost in my childhood years when life just got a bit too real. There is no better movie that portrays the point I'm trying to make than the 2019 French animated film, I Lost My Body. The movie deals with themes of childhood trauma, the impact severe loss can have on a person, as well as how to come to terms with and move beyond what you've lost in your childhood years. This video analysis is about understanding the why before seeking out the how. This video does contain spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie, I suggest that you go and watch it first. The Orphan is a common backstory element used for many of our beloved characters, including popular superheroes and characters in fairy tales, classical literature, movies and ancient stories. Modern examples include characters like Batman, Harry Potter, Spider-Man, Annie, Black Widow, Frodo, Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker. The list goes on and on. The Orphan frequently comes up in fairy tales as well. Cinderella, Belle from Beauty and the Beast, Hansel and Gretel and Tarzan were all orphans. More ancient stories include characters like Moses, Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, Hercules and Oedipus. And in I Lost My Body, the protagonist is yet again an orphan. In many of these stories, the orphan must undergo a journey towards wholeness where they have to come to terms with their past and heal from their past traumas. There is clearly something about the orphan that we resonate with. Many of us are not actual orphans, but we carry around with us orphan past that we cut off when we were younger. This frequent appearance of the orphan in many of our stories suggests that there is something about this specific type of psychological pattern that we internalize to understand and interpret our own experiences. When a psychological pattern is expressed in this symbolic form, we refer to it as an archetype. The term archetype was coined by psychiatrist Carl Jung. Jung writes in his collected works, 
Archetypes are identical psychic structures common to all, which together constitute the archaic history of humanity. In his book Man and His Symbols, Jung writes the following regarding archetypes. Just as the human body represents a whole museum of organs, each with a long evolutionary history behind it, so we expect to find that the mind is organized in a similar way. It can no more be a product without history than is the body in which it exists. By history, I do not mean the fact that the mind builds itself up by conscious reference to the past through language and other cultural traditions. I am referring to the biological, prehistoric and unconscious development of the mind in archaic man, whose psyche was still close to that of the animal. This immensely old psyche forms the basis of our mind, just as much as the structure of our body is based on the general anatomical pattern of the mammal. The trained eye of the anatomist or the biologist finds many traces of this original pattern in our bodies. The experienced investigator of the mind can similarly see the analogies between the dream pictures of modern man and the products of the primitive mind, its collective images and its mythological motifs. Archetypes are thus symbolic images that help us govern our behavior and construct and understand the world we inhabit. By understanding the symbols of our dreams, the stories we read and watch, and the art we create and observe, we can gain insight into our own internal world. I Lost My Body explores the archetype of the orphan within our modern context. Why this archetype arises, what type of internal dynamics are active within the orphan, and how to move beyond this psychological pattern. Integrating it along with your experiences in a meaningful way to bring about positive change in your life. Carol S. Pearson, an American author and educator, writes in her book, The Hero Within, Six Archetypes We Live By, that the orphan's basic plot structure is how I suffered or how I survived. Its principal task is therefore to survive and its gift is resilience. Nufal, a young pizza delivery boy, is disconnected from life. He seems to have no hopes or dreams. He is depressed, lacks any real sense of purpose or meaning, and clearly does not have any meaningful or healthy relationships with anyone in his life. Nufal seems to have given up on life. Life, for him, has nothing to offer but pain and suffering. Life takes away, but does not give back. To deal with this immense loss he experienced as a child, where he lost not only his parents but also the opportunity to pursue his dreams, he has to tune out from reality. Pearson writes in her book The Hero Within, the orphan is a disappointed idealist, and the higher the ideals about the world, the worse reality appears. The orphan emerges when we fall from innocence, when something happens that undermines our faith in our parents, authority figures, God, even life itself. The fall for Nafal is particularly difficult as he came from a loving family that encouraged him to dream, who made him believe that he could become whatever he wanted to become. Nafal's idealistic tendencies about what to expect from life and himself are shown when he says, that he wants to become not only a pianist or an astronaut, but a pianist and an astronaut. I want to be a pianist and an astronaut. That's my boy. Yeah, I want to be both. He wants to pursue the parts of himself that are creative and expressive, as well as the parts of himself that crave adventure and exploration, tapping into the innovative spirit that captivates him when he looks at the world he lives in. Portraying Nufel in this way is quite clever as it depicts the limitless potential of the child. A child is nothing in particular but also has limitless possibilities. This can be regarded as the child before the fall, but eventually the child becomes aware of their own limitations and realizes that not everything is possible. They have to come to terms with their circumstances and, like many of us, have to let go of their childhood dreams and fantasies. Pearson writes, Feeling like an orphan after the fall is an exceptionally difficult mode. The world appears dangerous, villainous and pitfalls are everywhere. Like a damsel in distress, the orphan must cope with a hostile environment without appropriate strength or skills. It seems to be a dog-eat-dog -dog world where people are either victims or victimizers. Even villainous behavior may be justified as simply realistic because the operative rule is do unto others before they do unto you. The dominant emotion of this worldview is fear and its basic motivation is survival. 
Nufal is trapped by the traumatic experiences of his past and his fall from innocence. Incapable of moving on with his life, he remains stuck in an orphan state. He works a dead-end job, which he is very bad at, has an extremely low self-concept, and has become a victim of his circumstances. Gabor Mate writes in his book The Myth of Normal, The meaning of the word trauma in its Greek origin is wound. Whether we realize it or not, it is our woundedness or how we cope with it that dictates much of our behavior, shapes our social habits and informs our ways of thinking about the world. It can even determine whether or not we are capable of rational thought at all in matters of the greatest importance to our lives. Nufal's view of himself and the world is filtered through this one experience, the loss of his parents. The world for Nufal has become a place not of dreams and hopes and love, but of pain and suffering. A place to fear and even a place to resent. Pearson writes, The fall leads to realism because the job of the orphan is to develop realistic expectations about life. When people give up their original childlike expectations, they are likely to go to the other extreme and expect too little from life. They shift from the innocent child to the orphan. The shift from the innocent child to the orphan is beautifully portrayed through Nufal's interactions with the fly. The director Jeremy Clappen states in an interview that the fly is a symbol of destiny. The fly is a, is a symbol of the destiny and mm -hmm. because in the book it was expressed by world, yes, by world. I need to put something who can evocate the destiny into the film. The fly represents some form of fate or inevitability, the path that should be undertaken by Nufel. The fly is present in all of Nufel's major life events. It shows up at the death of his parents, it's there when he arrives at his foster home and when he severs his hand. To understand more clearly what Jeremy Clapton means by destiny as well as the symbolism of the fly, we must look to the movie. I want to focus on two specific scenes. The first is when Nufal is young and he is trying to catch a fly. He fails continuously and complains that it is too hard. His father then gives him advice on how to catch the fly. This scene suggests that destiny is not necessarily an inevitability. That is, if you are destined to become, in the case of Nufal, an astronaut or a pianist or both, it will not just happen out of its own accord. You have to strive towards this end. There is a certain level of agency for you as the individual actor. Destiny is not something that is forced upon you, but rather something that you have to strive towards with patience and determination without any guarantee that it will work out in the end, but a journey we must nonetheless undertake. As Nufal's father points out, Never said it was easy. You can't always win. C'est la vie. This conceptualization of destiny portrays it as an interaction between the external world and what in the external world invites you or intrigues you to pursue specific dreams, goals, activities, etc. Destiny is thus not what will happen to you, but rather what things will guide you towards a specific end or goal, a meeting of the external and the internal. The goal of life is then to continuously follow this intuition in an attempt to one day hold it within your hands, so to speak. Khabur Mate might describe this interaction of the individual and their destiny as our yearning for authenticity and Carl Jung might describe this as the psyche's desire for individuation. But what happens when we are cut off from this intuition that guides us towards our own destiny? Khabur Mate writes in his book, The Myth of Normal, What is trauma? As I use the word, trauma is an inner injury, a lasting rupture or split within the self due to difficult or hurtful events. By this definition, trauma is primarily what happens within someone as a result of the difficult or hurtful events that befall them. It is not the events themselves. Trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens inside you is how I formulate it. He continues to write, Unresolved trauma is a constriction of the self, both physical and psychological. It constrains our inborn capacities and generates an endearing distortion of our view of the world and other people. Trauma, until we work it through, keeps us stuck in the past, 
robbing us of the present moment's riches, limiting who we can be. By impelling us to suppress hurt and unwanted parts of the psyche, it fragments the self. Until seen and acknowledged, it is also a barrier to growth. When trauma occurs, we lose our agency to undertake our own journeys. Tragedy strikes Nafal's life unexpectedly when he becomes an orphan. When Nafal arrives at his new home, there is a fly in the car with him. This is a second scene that will give us more clarity on what Claplin meant by destiny. This fly comes and sits on Nafal's lap, moving closer to his hand, expecting and in a way requesting Nafal to try and catch it. But Nufal does not accept this invitation. He pulls his hand back, giving up on his dreams, giving up on the pursuit of his destiny. This giving up can be seen as being disconnected from the internal impulses or intuitions that allow him to take action and pursue that which he finds meaningful. He does become an actual orphan, but this tragic event also causes certain parts of himself to be orphaned. They are cast away into the unconscious, where they become frozen within the mind and the body. Khabur Mate writes, as the lost connection gets internalized, it forges our view of reality. We come to believe in the world we see through its cracked lens. Nufal's cracked view of life becomes clear in how he views fate and destiny. Fate and as such reality is something to escape for Nufal rather than something to embrace and contend with. Nufal must formulate such a conceptualization of fate destiny and reality in order to cope with all the pain and suffering he has endured, for it is the denial of reality that can help the orphan endure difficult times. Pearson writes, The successful resolution of the orphan dilemma often depends on getting over the child's sense of entitlement. If I believe I was entitled to a happy childhood and did not have one, I can spend the rest of my life feeling cheated and never get on with living. If I believe I have the right to a perfect life, any hardship can leave me bitter and unhappy. This deterministic understanding of fate and destiny that Nufal holds indicates such a childlike entitled attitude of how life should be, rather than being able to accept how it is. Nufal feels robbed of his destiny, what he was meant to be and achieve, and perhaps rightly so, considering the traumatic experiences of his childhood. Nufal's response to the death of his parents is not abnormal, but rather adaptive. He had to be that way to cope with the immense pain of his situation. As such, he enters and remains stuck in this developmental phase as a way to adapt. But it is remaining stuck in this phase, the very thing that allowed him to adapt and survive, that prevents him from moving on and healing. Pearson writes, The archetype of the orphan is a tricky place to be. The orphan's task is to move out of innocence and denial and learn that suffering, pain, scarcity and death are an inevitable part of life. Nufal frequently tries to escape his reality through his imagination. This is evident during his conversation with Gabrielle over the intercom, where he imagines being cut off from the world in the high-rise building. What do you see? Nothing. Nothing vertical, only the horizon. It must be comforting to be cut off from the world like that. To see nothing, to hear nothing. We see him do something similar in the library where he fantasizes about being in the North Pole. Just close your eyes and put your hands over your ears like this. Press your ears a little, one after the other, very softly, like this. If you do it well, <laughs> it sounds like you're walking in the snow. These scenes have a striking similarity to one of Khabur Mate's patients when they commented on how they struggled to come to terms with their own traumatic past. It is a landscape of dread and betrayal and sorrow and cruelty. The last place you want to be is in your body. And so, you begin to live up in your head. You begin to live up here without any ability to protect your body, to know your body. This painful lament of Khabur Mate's patient describes someone that is disconnected from their body, something that is true for most if not all of Mate's trauma patients, making the title of this movie I Lost My Body even more meaningful and impactful. Mate writes, In the absence of relief, a young person's natural response, their only response really, is to repress and disconnect from the feeling states associated with suffering one no longer knows one's body. 
The title of the movie is not I lost my hand or even more impersonal I lost a hand. By losing the hand, Nufal loses the totality of his body and here the body can also be described as the totality of the psyche i.e. the self. Body should therefore be taken to represent the totality of his being and the loss of the hand which is only one part of his body inhibits his ability for wholeness and as such has an impact on the totality of his psyche. What is interesting however is the way the director decided to tell the story where the hands return to Nafal is told at the same time as Nafal's story and only in the end are we shown that the hand story started when Nafal severed his hand. This is quite clever and gives us even more insight into the main message of the movie. Due to the way the directors told the story of the hand simultaneously with Nufal's story and how the movie ends we realize that Nufal did not lose his body when his hand got severed but rather when he withdrew from life, when he had to tune out from reality in order to cope with the tragic and traumatic event that happened earlier in his life. The film's narrative is essentially a quest for wholeness, a journey for Nufal to heal the wounds of his emotional orphanhood and regain a sense of self. His severed hand, which takes on a life of its own, becomes a symbolic representation of this quest. Nufal's hand seeks to reunite with its owner, mirroring Nufal's own yearning to reconnect with the lost parts of himself. The portrayal of the hand in the movie was done in a very effective way. Although the hand has no facial expressions or cannot speak, they were able to make this hand express emotions. They made us as the audience care for this hand, the hand is a mind of its own, has clear motives and desires and also experiences fear, loss, pain, love and compassion. In the book of symbols, reflections on archetypal images, we find the following entry regarding the symbolic meaning of hands. Hands signify the sovereign, world-creating reach of consciousness. They embody effectiveness, industry, adaptation, invention, self-expression and the possession of a will for creative and destructive ends. Tiny hands, tied hands or a lack of hands suggest severe constraints on one's autonomy, an incapacity to grasp or claim the world, make one's desires real, form one's matter. Nufal's hands can thus mean to represent his ability to transform his world to express himself and to choose who he wants to become and what he wants to do in this world. Abilities he loses once he becomes an orphan. As the movie unfolds, we also start to realize that the hand represents not only certain abilities, but also Nufal's orphan parts that were exiled into his unconscious when his parents died. One scene in particular has stuck with me since the first time I watched the movie. It is when the hand is trying to get back to Nafal and comes across a toy car in a sandbox, reminding the hand of the car accident Nafal's parents died in. This scene makes it clear that the hand also has memories of its own, which the director showed throughout the hand's journey back to Nafal. The hand trying to reconnect to the body as the story unfolds breaks the chronological order of the story. The hand's desire for reconnection is thus not strictly bound to time. The quest for authenticity is thus constant, but sometimes only realized and acted upon after a traumatic or emotional event. Only once the hand is severed can it start to make its journey to reconnect to Nafal. It escapes quite literally in the beginning of the movie from a fridge, indicating it has been held within a frozen state and has to take a long and onerous journey to reconnect with Nafal, trying to bring to consciousness those repressed parts of himself he has neglected since childhood. The various challenges the hand faces represent how difficult it is for us to reconnect to our true and authentic selves. The level of agency of the hand also points to the fact that repressed memories and emotions can take on a life of their own within our unconscious mind. They can influence our behavior, beliefs, thought and emotions and to ensure that they do not govern our lives from the depths of our unconscious we must undertake a journey to bring them to light. The initial steps of Nufal's healing journey and as such the bringing to consciousness of his orphan parts did start in small ways before he lost his hand, which allowed the hand to reawaken within his unconscious and make its journey towards consciousness possible.
Nufal's relationship with Gabrielle is central to the film's themes. Gabrielle represents hope, love and the possibility of healing. She is a caring and empathetic character who sees beyond Nufal's emotional scars and connects with them on a deeper level. Their relationship is a source of comfort and support for Nufal as he navigates his traumatic past and uncertain future. Pearson writes, The orphan's dilemma is about looking for people to care for us. After the fall comes the long and sometimes slow climb back to trust and hope. The orphan eventually must learn enough self-reliance to hold out against temptations, to stay in negative or dehumanizing conditions. Most often that cannot be done until we embark on a search for someone to take care of us. Maybe there is no one now who will watch over me, but perhaps I can find someone. This desire to be cared for that someone out there will be able to fill the immense emptiness within an orphan is clearly portrayed in the movie with Nufel's immediate infatuation with Gabrielle. She showed a brief moment of care in their initial interaction over the intercom when she asked if he was okay after his motorcycle accident. I'm afraid the pizza and I were in a small accident. It doesn't look too good. How bad was it? It looks like a pizza. Topped with the chewed up remains of another pizza. No, I meant the accident. You didn't get hurt, right? Me? No, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. Nufal felt like someone actually saw him and perhaps believed that there is someone out there that would care for him. He then aims to track Gabrielle down by looking up her name in a phone book, finding out where she works and stalking her. Although perhaps a bit creepy, the movie portrays the orphan's clumsy attempts at intimacy and building meaningful relationships quite well. Having closed himself off from the world and other people, the orphan's initial attempts at connection would understandably be awkward and lacking tact. Nufal follows Gabrielle to her uncle's workshop where in a moment of panic he tells Gigi and Gabrielle that he is here for the apprenticeship. Perhaps Nufal at a conscious level took on the job to pursue Gabrielle, but it is at the very least a meaningful coincidence that the job he takes on requires him to work with his hands. A job that combines, albeit in a very basic way, two of his childhood dreams. Just like the pianist creates music with their hands, Nufal will be creating something with his hands. And just as the astronaut needs to be able to use their knowledge to explore their world in a practical way, requiring various technical skills and knowledge, Nufal needs to understand the practical and technical side of woodworking, where, as Gigi points out, he will need to use tools, accessories, and instruments. By pursuing Gabrielle and taking on this job, Nufal starts his journey towards healing and self-discovery. With the job, he is taking small steps towards self-expression and independence. The job allows him to move out of his orphaned home where he was neglected. Nufal regards his meeting with Gabrielle as one of fate and he follows through on this intuition where he allows himself to start the process of reconnecting with his true authentic self. The pursuit of Gabrielle is very important as Nufal allows himself to be vulnerable. He opens up to her and the amount of effort he goes through to build the igloo and reveal to her that he was the pizza delivery boy indicates a sense of openness and willingness to take a risk. Khabur Mate writes, Nothing in nature becomes itself without being vulnerable. The mightiest tree's growth requires soft and supple shoots, just as the hardest shell crustacean must first molt and become soft. The same goes for us. No emotional vulnerability, no growth. Things do however take a turn for the worse. Gabrielle was upset by Nufal's whole plan to pursue her and regarded his actions as selfish, as he did not take into account the health of her uncle when he took on the job. And when she reveals this to him, it is clear that Nufal barely noticed that her uncle was sick, revealing again the entitlement of the orphan as well as their clumsiness in their attempts to move beyond their own orphan state. Angered by Gabrielle's response, Nufal goes to his adopted brother's party. This is quite an important scene. At the party, someone goes and sits on Nufal's chair. I specifically want to contrast this scene with one of the scenes at the beginning of the movie. At the beginning of the movie when Nufal's boss screams at him, Nufal looks down and lacks any expression of emotion. Rather he dissociates and pushes those emotions down. 
this dissociation is evident in his lack of time awareness. He is always late with his deliveries and is stuck in his own head, making him less observant of external reality, where he crashes into other cars and even gets hit by a car on his motorcycle. At the end of the movie, Nufal does not back down from this confrontation, perhaps partially because he has been drinking, but partially also because he has started his own healing journey. He expressed his true feelings to Gabrielle in the best way he knew how, and after their confrontation, he allows himself to express his anger, perhaps not in the most appropriate way, but nonetheless, a small victory in this journey toward healing. The next day, Nufal shows up to work, hung over and with a black eye. Nowhere in the movie has the fly shown up in Nufal's story as a young adult up until this point. Nufal's willingness to take a risk, be vulnerable and express his emotions has allowed him to be open enough to allow his destiny, his journey, back into his life, even be it at an unconscious level. It is however at this moment that Nufal loses his hand. In quite an insightful way, the movie shows that Nufal only reconnected with his hand, which as mentioned before represents his own orphan parts, when his hand got severed. The shackles of his trauma started to loosen and he was finally ready to accept his past. The same patient of Khabur Mate I quoted earlier reflects on her journey to recover her lost body. What was so remarkable about my encounter with cancer, V told me, was that the whole journey from waking up after a 9 hour surgery and losing several organs and 70 nodes. I woke up with bags and tubes and everything coming out of me, but for the first time in my life, I was a body. It was painful, but it was also exhilarating. I was like, I'm a body, oh my god, I'm here, I'm inside this body. Her account of a sudden at homeness in her physical self is emblematic of how healing works. When trauma shackles begin to loosen, we gladly reunite with the severed parts of ourselves. This brings me to the last element of the movie I want to discuss, the recording device. The recording device plays an important role in the movie. It helps us fill in the gaps of Nufal's past, but also represents Nufal's childhood memories. Just like Nufal, who recorded his memories of his childhood with this device, we also store the memories of our childhood and internalize these memories and the emotions associated with these memories to formulate our view of the world and of ourselves. Our early life experiences form the foundation of the way in which we view the world. In the book The Continuum Concept In Search of Happiness Lost, author John Leadloff notes, the earliest established components of an infant's psychobiological makeup are those most formative of his lifelong outlook. What he feels before he can think is a powerful determinant of what kind of things he thinks when thought becomes possible. Khabur Mate elaborates on these insights from John Lidloff by writing, in fact, the impact goes well beyond the content of thoughts. Research has shown beyond any doubt that early experiences molds behaviors, emotional patterns, unconscious beliefs, learning styles, relational dynamics, and the ability to handle stress and regulate ourselves. In other words, early development sets the ground, whether strong or shaky, for all the learning behavior and health, or lack of it, that will come later. All of the flashbacks to Nufal's past are black and white, even the happy memories. The memories at the beginning of the movie are wholesome. We see a loving father and mother interacting with a bright and intelligent young child. These are happy memories, yet they are all black and white. This is the way Nufal views these memories, although he can recognize that the content of the memories represent a time he was happy. For him, they just remind him of what he lost, and as such, the happy memories become melancholic. All of the color or the vibrance of the memories are lost. He interprets these memories through the lens of the death of his parents. This gives us insight into our own memories and how they function. Our memories are not merely a recording device that helps us to keep record of the past. They change along with our perception of them as well as the insight we have when we are older and we reflect on these memories. A traumatic event can for example make happy memories sad like in the case of Nufal. 
or to use a different example you might be happily married but then one day you find out that your spouse has been cheating on you now all of a sudden happy memories of the past are reinterpreted through a lens of betrayal rather than through a lens of trust a moment of insight can, however, also change a bitter memory into something meaningful that leads to some form of growth or maturity. This function of our memories is very important for us to be aware of. It makes us aware of the fact that our memories are not a purely objective account of the past. They are filtered through the emotions we had during that specific time or event but they are also filtered through your current relation towards those events and the emotions they currently evoke within you. Due to the episodic nature of our memories, we tend to forget the mundane and tend to remember specific highs and lows of our lives. A handful of experiences has a significant impact on a very large proportion of our values, beliefs, attitudes, affective states and self-concept. This is displayed by Nafal in his recordings. Those recordings represent specific instances of his past and he relies on those very specific instances to construct his current understanding of the world and himself. Nufal has kept his childhood recordings safe. He has kept them locked up in a little box, which he also takes with him when he leaves to go and stay with Gigi. Nowhere in the movie do we see Nufal listening to these recordings as a young adult, suggesting he has not had the courage to revisit those memories. After his confrontation with Gabrielle and after he lost his hand, he does however listen and reminisce about them. Nufal must also come to terms with his failed romantic pursuits of Gabrielle, the one thing or person he was hoping could change his life, as well as his failures in his new job. With only one hand and after the accident, he will most likely not be able to continue working in Gigi's shop. Pearson writes, Paradoxically, the real heroic response of the orphan experiencing the fall is to feel our own pain, disappointment and loss. That is, to accept being an orphan. For the first time in the movie, Nufal allows the full weight of his past and present to be felt. In a sleep state, the hand finds its rightful place next to Nufal, and while reconnecting with Nufal, Nufal seems to have dreams of his childhood. The orphan parts of Nufal, which he has banished to the unconscious parts of his psyche, have now returned to consciousness. Pearson writes, To move beyond the orphan state of the journey, one must first fully be in it, and that means confronting one's own pain, despair, and cynicism. It also means mourning the loss of Eden, letting oneself know that there is no safety, that God, at least the childish notion of a daddy God, is dead. At the end of the movie, he decides to replace the recording of the car accident that caused his parents' death with a new recording. A recording of him jumping from the rooftop onto the crane. He takes the memory that has caused him the most pain and he uses it as a source of inspiration to create a new memory. To take a simple yet bold step into a new direction, not allowing the memory and his past to dictate his life anymore. He reconnects with his orphan parts. Pearson writes, This thanksgiving and mourning empties them out and makes way for the new. Having felt those feelings, they are ready for the excitement of new growth. This is the meaning of the concept of the fortunate fall, and the ultimate gift of this archetype of the orphan. We are propelled out of dependency and into our own journeys. On the road, we learn through experience that pain need not be meaningless affliction. It can provide ample motivation for learning, bonding, and growth. How can we use this movie as an aid in our own healing journey? How can the messages of vulnerability and acceptance, despite tragedy, help us reconnect with the orphan parts within ourselves? Well, if we were to follow in the footsteps of Nufal, it would be to allow ourselves to fully embrace the pain and suffering of our past, to take our most painful memories that we have been carrying around our whole lives and reflect on them, with the aim of accepting them. Similar to Nufal, perhaps we can take small steps to rekindle and care for our own orphan parts in order to heal the wounds of our past disappointments and areas of hurt. Nufal took on a job without fully realizing it, that allowed him to reconnect with the parts of himself that had the desire to create things. 
In a similar way, we can maybe start by allowing ourselves to do things we know we really want to do, but never allow ourselves to do. One of the things I started doing on my own healing journey was to allow myself to truly start enjoying watching movies, and watching movies that I knew I wanted to watch. And as simple as that might sound, for a long time I didn't allow myself to do any of the things I knew I truly enjoyed. Something I'm sure many of you can relate to. And making these YouTube videos has been a way for me to reconnect with my own orphan parts. So to go back to what I said in the introduction, the steps that I took in my own healing journey that helped me the most to move forward was not to take on as much responsibility as I could bear, or fixing my daily habits to be as optimal as possible, or aiming for the highest good I could conceptualize. It was rather, and still is, the act of accepting my past with compassion and love, where I focused on reconnecting with my own orphan parts. This was what allowed me to increase my own freedom of choice in my day-to-day -day life. As Habor Mate writes, the onset of inauthenticity may not be a choice, but with awareness and self-compassion, authenticity can be. In fact, the film is not about the severed hand, it's about the rest of the body, and it's about us, in fact, the, you know, the, how, what is it to be human, what is it to experiment life when you are living in the present, stuck between your past, your future, and the film is about this uh, existential quest. It's about love, uh, loss. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please uh, like and subscribe to my channel and share it to anyone that you think might find it interesting or meaningful as well. I also set up a Patreon account if you want to support me and help me to make more videos like this in the future. At the moment, there's nothing that exclusive or special about the Patreon. Um, as this is still a part-time thing that I mainly do on the weekends when I have time. But as the channel grows, I will try and make more exclusive content. Uh, you can also support me on the Buy Me A Coffee platform. Thank you for watching again and goodbye for now.